My name's Tom D. I'm a professor here at the Stanford Graduate School of Education and a member of our Center on Education Policy Analysis. So um, I'm also going to be talking about uh, is education improving, specifically focusing on the U.S. because my, my knowledge of Brazil is not totally trivial, but it's, it's developing, shall we say. But I want to underscore some comparisons that I think might see the discussion in interesting ways. First, is education improving in the U.S.? I would argue yes, but unevenly and perhaps in ways that are interesting as we think about some of the comparative issues here. In particular, we're in an unusual era in U.S. education policy because the federal government and to some extent foundations have been playing an unusually aggressive and prescriptive role in trying to drive educational improvement changes in what are essentially local democratic institutions, you know, schools that operate under a federalist system in the U.S. as they do in Brazil. So, the, you know, and, and this unusual era in U.S. education policy has been incredibly controversial, but also interesting for researchers like me because it creates opportunities to think about what works and what doesn't. So what I thought would be interesting is just to pull out some selected lessons from this unusual federalist era in U.S. education policy, drawing on some of my own research and with collaborators that we can use to think about the broader issues. And in particular, I'm going to stress things that appear to be working, but also underscore some humility, some agnosticism about the role of a central government and its capacity to drive really meaningful change at scale in federalist systems of schooling. So I'm going to quickly, in my limited time, walk through three things. First, a little bit about what we've learned from consequential school accountability in the U.S. Second, what we've learned about from the recent stimulus-funded efforts to drive turnarounds in chronically low-performing schools. And third, what we've been learning from the rollout of new teacher performance assessment systems, in particular underscoring some work I've been doing in Washington, D.C., which I think has a really unique and compelling system. Um, and just to preview, I mean, essentially the main conclusions here is each of these policy innovations, I think, provides us with a kind of compelling proof point on what may be able to improve school performance. But I think we also have a growing awareness about the practical implementation challenges of doing this well uh, in a top-down kind of way and the mediating role that what's on the ground in local districts and schools can play in the influence of these reforms. And in my mind now, increasingly, it's just seeding some doubt about the capacity of the federal go government, again, to drive change at scale and forcing me to rethink uh, what is the role of a central government uh, in, in this kind of domain. Okay, so first a little bit about No Child Left Behind, and I assume many of you are familiar with this. It was the major federal version of school accountability in the U.S. It was introduced in 2002 to bipartisan acclaim and essentially required all states to design and implement test-based school accountability. Critically, it included public reporting of performance at the school level, including reporting for individual subgroups, which I think was useful and illuminating in terms of the dialogue. And it, it implied increasingly severe sanctions for schools that had repeated failure to make adequate yearly progress towards test-based proficiency goals. Now, it's fiendishly difficult to evaluate a policy like this because it went to scale simultaneously across the nation. Um, and some people have been creative by trying to leverage differential contrasts and sanction risk, but that's among all schools that really were subject to this regime. What I've done in my work with a collaborator at Michigan, Brian Jacob, leverage the fact that there's a kind of natural control group for thinking about this that's based on the fact that there were you know, more than half of U.S. states actually implemented something like NCLB in the prior decade. And so NCLB really catalyzed de novo experience with school accountability in the other half of the states. So a comparison that leverages how did the states that had new systems of school accountability to those that already had something like NCLB gives us a basis for thinking about its overall effect. And so just to give you a, a very simple visual representation of this research design, here we have you know, the, the black triangles 
are states that had never adopted school accountability until NCLB came online. And the dashed line with the circles are those that did adopt over this period. So we see throughout the 90s on fourth grade NAEP scores, these are the low stakes tests, not what schools are being incentivized to meet, but the federal low stakes tests. We see the schools that introduced accountability over this period saw comparative growth, okay, relative to the states that did not. But we want to think about what happened when No Child Left Behind came online in these states that had uh, de novo experiences with school accountability. Well, we saw big, big changes and a change in the, in the slope of their growth over time. But that could reflect not just NCLB, but any number of things that were changing over this period. So the argument is to then take, well, what was going on contemporaneously in these schools that had already had school accountability as kind of a counterfactual for that. And then when you combine the two, you get something, uh, you know, a reasonably credible quasi-experimental estimate of the effect of these reforms. And so what we find when we do this is that NCLB did appear to drive some improvements in school, but they were targeted to math to early and to early grades. And they were meaningful gains, but not the kind of transformative gains people talked about when they articulated this policy. So let me turn then quickly to school turnarounds and then teacher evaluation and then try to seed some of the summative discussion. So I've been doing work on school turnarounds. The federal, uh, Secretary, U.S. Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, called for a nationwide focus on turning around chronically underperforming schools, the lowest 5% in the nation, saying we want transformation, not tinkering. And because of the U.S. stimulus package in 2009, he had money to kind of back up and seed these kinds of reforms. He, uh, the U.S. Department of Education channeled $3 billion out of $100 billion it had at its disposal for stimulus spend it, spending into these redesigned school improvement grants. And um, this grant program prioritized eligibility to what they called persistently lowest achieving schools, essentially the lowest 5% within a state. And they gave these schools serious money, up to $2 million per school per year over three years. But if schools accepted this money, there's a sense in which they had to sing for their supper. They had to implement a pretty prescriptive uh, federally defined whole school reform. And most chose what was called the transformation model. And it had multiple facets to it. Leadership change, bringing in a new turnaround principle for these schools. Instructional reforms in terms of increased learning time and data-driven differentiated pra practices and embedded professional development for teachers. And socio-emotional supports, providing health and nutrition services for students and, and also providing outside technical assistance. So the theory of change here was to shock persistently low-performing schools into a better equilibrium we need to move simultaneously on multiple fronts, okay? So I've got a study that appropriately enough focuses on California, which is one of the largest SIG recipients, but that meant they had 200 or so eligible schools of which 92 were able to competitively apply for these grants. And the basic logic of the research design is to remember schools were eligible if they were in that lower 5%. Well, the idea is we can make really credible causal inference about the effect of the form by comparing those that were just on the eligible side of the threshold to just on the uh, ineligible side. And many of you may be familiar with this. That's what we call a regression discontinuity design. And here's the basic picture I find with this. The vertical axis is a measure, a test-based measure of school performance that's part of California's accountability system, the academic performance index. And this threshold separates ineligible schools from eligible schools. And what we see after the reform is a, a fairly large, statistically significant notch up right at that threshold that defined which schools were eligible and which schools weren't. So evidence that the turnaround really seemed to be working within California. Okay, so let me switch quickly, because of my limited time, to performance-based compensation for teachers. We know high-quality teaching matters. We know there's a large variance in teacher quality. But there's also some cynicism, because we've run several small-scale boutique experiments that suggest providing cash for test score incentives to teachers doesn't change instructional practice, doesn't improve teacher performance. But there's been a, a, a more uh, sophisticated movement towards multifaceted performance-based compensation teachers through federal initiatives in the US, like the Teacher Incentive Fund, the NCLB waivers, Race to the Top. And these provide educators with measures of their effectiveness that are based on multiple traits, not just test scores, 
uh, you know, in particular privileged classroom observations, as well as pay for, for performance, use and tenure decision, additional pay opportunities for leadership and professional development. Well, the leading example of this is arguably DC public schools. Under a very controversial chancellor, Michelle Rhee, and by the way, this is this was a uniquely divisive cover of Time Magazine during her tenure that some people thought captured the kind of reform-minded momentum you want in urban school districts and other people thought was the height of hubris in terms of top-down autocratic reform. Well, she introduced this teacher performance system that was unique in several ways. High-powered and individually targeted incentives for both low-performing and high-performing teachers. For teachers in the left tail of the distribution, what ultimately became credible dismissal threats, and for teachers in the right tail of the distribution, really significant pay increases. In DC now, you can advance as a teacher to a salary of roughly $130,000 within just eight or nine years if you're persistently high-performing. Okay, so, uh, you know, the performance system was based mostly on classroom observation. It was very attentive to key implementation details and design features, and critically, it had leadership buy-in. Okay, so what do we see? Well, I also do a regression discontinuity study here with my colleague that compares teachers who had a dismissal threat to those, oops, sorry, uh, back up compares teachers who had dismissal threats to those who didn't, those who had financial incentives to those who didn't. And let's focus on this dismissal threshold, which is utterly unique in the US experience, and I expect the Brazilian one as well. What we see is that teachers who faced a dismissal threat uh, were more likely to leave the district voluntarily, and among those who remained, we see pretty dramatic increases in their performance. And anecdotal evidence from the low stakes NAEP scores that it's driving system-wide change in this urban school district. Okay, so some concluding thoughts. Um, you might think based on this that I'm pretty optimistic about federally driven top-down reforms, but I think I'm actually growing increasingly skeptical. I mean, there's certainly a lot of cynicism about the inflexibility of NCLB and the lack of wisdom around this moonshot rhetoric. In California, there were these school improvement grants that were awarded competitively, but all the evidence from other states suggests they weren't similarly effective. And often they just gave them to every eligible schools and the schools cashed the check and didn't really do anything. Uh, similarly, outside of DC, other places implementing teacher incentive fund reforms, uh, there's evidence that they're just really doing kind of cosmetic things. And in fact, even several large urban school districts had to return millions of federal dollars because they couldn't secure teacher buy-in. So what does this mean going forward? Well, it's uncontroversial that there's an important federal role for protecting constitutional rights, for promoting equitable funding through things like Fundefi in Brazil and Title I in the US and supporting basic research. But I think there might be a, a, a more clearly articulated federal role around understanding and supporting the political, the institutional, the economic context that influence local capacity for meaningful reform. It's just one example. Establishing data systems so people can know what's going on in their local communities is critical. And also, my final thought is I'd like to suggest as a possible alternative to highly prescriptive federal reforms that seek to touch all schools, something that's instead targeted that seeks to award federal support competitively to state and local communities that can establish they've got leadership buy-in and the promise of high implementation fidelity. And the argument here is that that kind of more curated federal activity um, can help us establish proof points of what works that can hopefully then uh, bridge out elsewhere without promoting some of the cynicism I think we've seen in the US context. So thank you, and I apologize for running over.